Geek Live. Today we are talking about one of my favourite topics, which is a comparison between two of my favourite book series and what will I think soon be two of my favourite TV shows as well, Game of Thrones and Lord of the Rings. And we're going to be looking at not just what the similarities are, what the differences are, a little bit about the inspirations, how much of what George R. R. Martin has been doing has been based on Lord of the Rings, and what might we expect in the this mega budget Amazon uh, Lord of the Rings series. And I have got with me, um, it's her first time on this channel, but uh, I'm sure many of you know her, um, a little bit of a, a geek and expert on talking uh, things. Uh, please do say hi uh, if you're live in the chat to uh, the wonderful Clueless Fangirl. Hello. <laughs> um, I go by many names. It was so funny. Um, hello. Good night, uh, everybody. Um, because Robert asked me um, before I came on, what is the name you want to be um, introduced by? And I'm, I go by many names in different realms. You do, and I'm going to call you Helen because that's how I know you. So, uh, so we'll go with Helen uh, for now. Um, the the other thing that I want to announce first up is that I kind of uh, teased it for the last two weeks about merch, about mugs. Uh, In Deep Geek mugs are coming now. Uh, Today, I'm going to be telling you how you can get an In Deep Geek mug if you want one. Uh, if you're watching live, uh, about halfway through, I'll make the the, uh, the announcement of how you get hold of them. If you're watching this a little bit later, scroll forward to about 45 minutes. That's when I'll, I'll be sort of uh, giving out the details of that. But let's start off, first of all, uh, talking uh, sort of high level stuff. I, I know you're a huge Tolkien fan. What is it that you're um, thinking, first of all, about the, the TV show when it happens? What are you most looking forward to? What are you really excited about? Well, um, I mean, we heard uh, before we saw these uh, tweets that confirmed that Amazon is really doing it and what they are doing. Um, we we heard there will be a show that they dropped a lot of money on on the show, on the production, production value, but also for the Tolkien estate. And um, then there were all these rumors. Um, will it be will the movies be redone or what is the content? Um, and then we got all these tweets and after like the second or third tweet, you know, they went out with um, the number of how, how the rings were forged and everything. And then after two or three tweets, I, I got the idea or latest when they showed Numenor that it will be about the second age. And um, I was so excited um, about that because um, it's a timeline we just heard about, like Galadriel talking um, about it and you heard about it in songs and whatnot. But um, yeah, we, we don't know much about it if you haven't read The Cimmerillion or other stuff. So I'm super excited about the timeline. That's, um, yeah what I'm really excited about and that it's not just a redo of the stuff we already know. Absolutely. So for those who don't know, um, I'm going to put out my first Lord of the Rings Tolkien video in a few days time on Hobbit Day, which is the 22nd of September. So I think that's Sunday. <laughs> uh, so um, that's my first of what will probably be many Tolkien and Lord of the Rings videos I'm going to be doing. And that's going to be setting out what is the second age. And we've been told that the, the TV show is going to be covering or is going to be set in the second age. Um, and that's not the bit that we know about. The bit that we know about happened at the end of the Third Age. The Second Age is massive. It's uh, 3,441 years long, to be, to be exact, and a lot of different things happened in there, and perhaps we'll sort of unpack a little bit later on in the stream some of the major things that happened. But as I say, keep an eye out for the video that's coming out in a few days' time. Uh, I did want to very quickly say uh, thank you for a couple of Super Chats that came in before we went on air. Uh, firstly, to Ariel Winchester saying, hey, Robert, I'm sorry I won't be able to tune in uh, as I have my anatomy lab practical. Well, good luck with that. That sounds uh, <laughs> very impressive. Uh, but thank you so much for all you do. Your videos always help me get through the week and stressful days. Well, uh, thank you very much for that. That's very kind. And thank you for the uh, the super chat. More release says in honor of Frodo and Samwise Gamgee. 
we have Samoyed Gamji here. Um, uh, just my usual gift of love, support, and appreciation for all the excellent content on both your channels and for Helena. Uh, looking forward to this live stream and participating in the chat. And also for Chrissy and all the mods. And just to say, yes, uh, uh, Chrissy Volstones is there uh, as a moderator, a fantastic moderator. Thank you, Chrissy. Uh, and to everyone who's a moderator in the chat, I really appreciate what you do. Um, it helps this channel. Uh, and many other channels as well. A lot of these moderators work across a number of different channels. It helps us so much. So thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, let's start, as always, I kind of try and structure these around uh, what my patrons are asking. Uh, they all say before each live stream, I ask my patrons, what are the questions that they have on this topic? What are the things that they want answered? And I structure my uh, live streams around those questions. So. Let's start um, with a few comparisons between uh, the Game of Thrones and Lord of the Rings. Now, uh, we were talking a little bit beforehand, and I know that you've got some thoughts on this, about character comparisons. Now, uh, Catgirl of the North says, uh, I'd love a main character comparison between Lord of the Rings and A Song of Ice and Fire. In uh, your analysis of the TV show, you compared John to Frodo, which I agree with, who is the parallel to Aragorn? Who, what about Gandalf, Saruman, etc.? I have my own ideas, but would love to hear yours. Now, for those who don't know it, and I'll throw this over to Helen in just one second. Uh, for those who don't know it, my sort of pithy take on Jon Snow's character in A Song of Ice and Fire is that he's being written as if he's an Aragorn character, this great king who was promised uh, with prophecies, who's going to rule and, and all the rest of it. But in reality, he's actually a Frodo character who's going to carry this great burden and he's going to achieve roughly what he was supposed to be doing. But the world that he's saved is just going to be dead to him and he's going to head off in his case, north afterwards in the way that uh, Frodo went west. So so that's my kind of pithy take on the character of Jon Snow, is that he's being written as Aragorn, but actually he's like Frodo. But what do you think, Helen? Are there other characters that we can kind of draw some kind of uh, similarities between from Lord of the Rings and, and A Song of Ice and Fire? Yeah, well, let me add something to that, because um, I think that's a very interesting topic, right, because um, of the two characters you just mentioned, because I think, you know, there's a lot of prophecy in there as well. And I think there you can see the playing out of prophecy in Lord of the Ring versus A Song of Ice and Fire, because in Lord of the Rings, it's pretty clear from the beginning that Aragorn has this arc, you know, he's... Um, He's destined to be king and you know he will be king um, and he is king in the end. And um, this is the, you know, like in the Song of Ice and Fire, the prophecy is completely different. It's not clear. Will John be king? Will he not? Um, it's a, you know, it's a very windy road. I mean, yes, Aragon has, um, you know, there are a lot of challenges for him, but it's pretty clear from the beginning that where the road ends and this is you know like because we talk a lot about prophecies and i think these two characters where you think they have the same destiny and the same end but actually they don't absolutely so do you have so my my second favorite kind of building off of the john snow is frodo is yeah uh, <laughs> the sam and sam thing which is pretty obvious i think to to anyone who kind of watches it you're sam well and sam wise best friends to to yeah. Frodo slash John, uh, and just like the uh, as as close as you get to a, a good, truly good character. Yeah. Um, the 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 question that we got from Cap Girl of the North is: Are there any uh, characters that like Saruman or Gandalf? Do they also have analogies over in uh, in A Song of Ice and Fire? Do you think, or do you think that actually uh, it's not that clear cut? The, Sam and Sam, or, or are oh there well, yes. Yeah. Well, let's start with Sam and Sam. Do you think that that yeah. is a fair analogy? Yeah, well, I, I do think so, and I always loved. You know, they um, Lord of the Ring always talks about the deeds of the little people that are very important, and Sam is both Sams are the little people who do really important things, and they are never 
really tempted. And what I find super interesting is their end, that they are literally, well, we don't know the end in the books, but we mm. know the end of Sam in the series, that they are literally the only people who find love in the end. Like Sam has Gilly and mm. Sam um, Wisegamji gets married to um, Rosie, whatever her name is. <laughs> um, and I mean, he leaves Middle Earth in the end, but he has a pretty amazing life in the Shire after they return. And it's a very similar ending, which I love. Yeah, exactly. And and it's it's almost as if, so the Frodo slash John character saves the world for them. Yeah. I, that's, that's, yeah. that's how it kind of feels. And, and, and then they uh, leave. Exactly, and then they leave, and you get this. Uh, so obviously, the Lord of the Rings ends with Sam. Uh, that's yeah. that's where it ends because yeah. he is, in purely classical literary terms, he is the hero. Frodo may well have been the main protagonist, but he is the hero. He is yeah. the person. The story ends when his story ends. Well, he said, "I'm back," and that's when the story ends. When he comes back to 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 his life yeah. um and i loved what you said about the the little people because this is a theme tolkien was very big on this also a lot of his um his sort of contemporaries like c.s lewis they kind of uh, eulogize the the little people the kind of the salt of the earth the working class types if you if you go back into uh, the magician's nephew in narnia then you find that actually it's that the starting point is not some sort of great professor but really it's like the the cabbie the salt of the earth character who's there and then even if you go into like harry potter then again you find the real kind of the heroes are people like the Weasleys who are just like they're they're again they're kind of working class, but you're on their side. So um, yeah, I thought that was a that was a fantastic uh, point. Uh, in terms of the other characters, the only one I would say, and I've I've mentioned a few times about this idea of the scouring of the Shire, which is the penultimate chapter in the Lord of the Rings is something that George R. R. Martin has said he wants to replicate the feel of that at the end mm. of A Song of Ice and Fire. Now, what that means, I think, is that there has to be a sort of a secondary baddie, as in, um, you know, spoiler alert, if you've not read The Lord of the Rings, but at, the, <laughs> at, the, at the end of The Lord of the Rings, shame. then, exactly, we, we get, uh, yeah, shame. Uh, then, then we would get, um, so Saruman basically turns up in the Shire uh, and does bad stuff. And Grima, and, yeah. And Grima Worm Tongue. And, uh, and the hobbits returning back after after the everything with the ring and the wars and all that is gone, they return back and they have to deal with this final threat of the kind of the secondary baddie. And that is the feel that George R. R. Martin wants for the end of A Song of Ice and Fire. And so for me, the question is therefore, who is taking on that kind of Saruman or Grima role mm. in A Song of Ice and Fire? And I personally think that that is actually going to be a Euron and Cersei thing. They are going to, yeah. and they sort of showed it on the show yeah. uh, that, you know, once the, the threat from the White Walkers, the others have been dealt with, then you have, well, who's in charge of King's Landing now? And I suspect we're going to have that kind of thing in the show. Does, does that kind of make sense to you in terms of like what the scaring the Shire feel is? Yeah, totally. No, no, totally. I um I wouldn't have predicted Cersei and Euron um per se, but yeah, no, I, I get that. And what I also find super interesting about that is um the idea behind it, because you know, um when you get introduced to the Lord of the Rings, where does it start? It starts well when you start with Lord of the Rings um as a book and not with the Cimmerillion, you start in the Shire, right? And um, Tolkien wants to, and, and it ends in the Shire. And in between, there's nothing about the Shire. I mean, they think about the Shire, they fight for the Shire. But, you know, ending there, because the Shire is very similar to our world, because they have umbrellas, and they have petty people, and they have um, families fighting each other for spoons, for golden spoons and whatnot. And um, it's it gives you a feeling of, being at home and it's not 
you know, be, because you you don't you don't drop in a complete foreign world. Um, you start with a shire and um, you get to know all these uh, things. And um, I find it very interesting that then in the end, the shire. So what does that tell you? Like, be aware of the wars in your own in our world. Um, and you know, like that that kind of idea because the shire is our world. I think and or very similar and um it's i find that very interesting that he ends and has this second war in in the shire yeah it, it's um it's very much that they have been fighting particularly sam is fighting to uh keep the shire as it was this is the his home his safe yeah. place where he wants to come back to and then they get back there and it's not what it was and so they have to like try and reclaim that. So yeah, it's uh, industrialized and everything exactly. like like his world, you know, like Tolkien's world at that time. Yeah, exa exactly. Um, I just want to quickly go across to a couple of super chats. We had Todd Mullis. Thank you so much saying uh, thanks so much for the fantastic content. You're very welcome. Um, Lisa Love saying just a quick thanks for answering my question. Carry on. Well, thank you again. Thank you very much. You are very welcome. <laughs> uh, and then Benjamin Norris saying first time writer as welcome. Uh, thank you for getting me into the Game of Thrones books. Looking forward to your Lord of the Rings content. Uh, thank you. As I say, one of the uh, I'm really looking forward to producing Lord of the Rings content. Um, I'm hoping to make it a regular part of this channel. Uh, but the first part I'm going to be doing, the first one I'm going to be doing is what's in, what, what's the second age about? What, what might we see? And we'll get onto this in just one second. What might we see therefore in the show when it uh, eventually happens? Uh, but I will be asking my uh, my patrons at ten dollar plus level. One of the perks there is that I go to them and ask them what do they want uh, me to be making videos on. So I will be going to them at some point in the next week and saying, once I've done this, what else do you want me to be covering in this massive world that we've got? This legendarium of of, of Tolkien. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, can I can I add something to that question we were talking about can. since we we're talking about since twenty minutes? So what? Um, because we were talking a lot about people, but um, I'm a, a very visual person. Uh, this is what I do for a living, and um, the scenes that uh, talking about um, Game of Thrones, the series, and uh, the Lord of the Ring movies. Because I think a lot of people haven't read the books uh, or haven't read all books, but love the movies. I mean, they're still classics after so many years and um what i loved um and what i found because we were talking about parallels like a dragon burning a city well that was the whole bit but still um <laughs> you know that that image um in season eight that that was pretty amazing and then the army swooping in last minute you know like the helms deep when i when i saw the battle of the bastards and um uh, um, little finger and uh, Sansa coming in last minute, um, you know, with with, a, with a, everybody on the horses and everything. I mean, it was literally like Gandalf and the Rohirrim riding to Helm's Deep. Um, so visual, and you know, the Mad King on the throne and Denethor on the throne with wanting to burn his son. Like they're very like visually, there are a lot of. Um, images and scenes that are very much alike. And last uh, last thing on that, um, because it's not about people, but about things. And I, I'm a big um, swords person. This is why I love Star Wars. And, um, you know, I always loved the story on, on the swords um, in Lord of the Rings and especially in the Silmarillion. And you have the same in A Song of Ice and Fire. You know, you have all these the history of the swords, they have names, they, they have a really long history, they belong to houses, and um, you have the same, you know, Valyrian steel versus all the elvish blades, and it's forgotten today how to really forge them, even Gandalf and um, I think um, Elrond um, say, you know, in this times we can't forge the blades like in the first age, and the same in, in uh, Game of Thrones. Um, and the Song of Ice and Fire, you know, um, and all the discussions about the sword of um, the of House Dane. What, what's the name? Um, uh, Symbol Star. Uh, no, no, no. The, the name of the sword. Yeah. 
It, it, ah. so, so, so the sword is dawn, uh, but it's I just am. like the, so. It, it's the 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 title that comes with is is the 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 uh, the sword of the morning. The sword um, of the morning, yes. Yeah. So, so that's yeah. probably what you're thinking of. Yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, I love I, I love those um, parallels. And you know, it's more than just characters. It's also things and scenes. And I don't want to say they he copied or the, the the they copied it, but obviously we are all influenced by the stuff we read and see. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and I think that there's a so George R. R. Martin's kind of literary relationship with J.R.R. R. Tolkien seems to be this half uh, trying to pay some kind of homage, homage to what the influence of Lord of the Rings was and half of it kind of reacting against stuff that he personally didn't like. Now, he's mm. always said that he holds this as like one of the finest works of literature and and and, and out of everything that he cites as a, an inspiration, clearly Lord of the Rings is right at the very top of that list. Um, there are a, a few things, though, and, and uh, Andrew K, I saw in the chat, was uh, saying, I wonder if there was any significance in George R. R. Martin naming Carl Drogo after Frodo's father. Was it <laughs> I mean, I think that, so Frodo is Frodo, son of Drogo. Um, I think this is one of those, so George R. R. Martin does this a lot, is he just drops in little nods to to various writers that he likes. He, he includes a huge amount of nif different names and, and sometimes like rather random amusing names like Kermit and things like that. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, he does this a lot. I think that was just a nod. Um, I don't think that there was any kind of extra kind of literary no. level there that was going on. Um, no. Uh, Stephen Durrant in the chat also saying the scouring of the Shire was meant to be uh, showing hard times and trauma after victory, mirroring mirroring post-war Britain. Yeah, I think that that's that's very true. Yeah. I think that it's um, it's the idea that war itself, uh, when even when it ends, hard times carry on and and that's very much Tolkien himself will come onto this I'm sure in a moment but he he was part of World War One he saw it he was traumatized by it he saw the horrors of war and he came home and still the horrors carried on because people had to live with all of their loss and all the rest of it so yeah that was very much uppermost in his mind I think when he was thinking about these kind of things is that just just because the war itself had finished doesn't mean that the suffering suddenly uh, gets you know, disappears mm. um, uh, and this kind of brings us on to uh, a fascinating question from Bryn Jones who's talking about uh, says to, to my mind one of the most moving passages of Lord of the Rings is Tolkien's description of the dead marshes which in one of his letters he describes as being a reflection of his own experiences on the Somme during World War I. Um, equally, Septon Meribald's speech on broken men stands out in George R. R. Martin's work. What do you make of the portrayal of war in Middle-earth and Westeros? Um, so, I mean, I think the, the, the first point for those who don't know or remember the the dead uh, the dead marshes were we did see it on the in the film uh, Frodo and Sam uh, and Gollum go through there they this was basically this was an, an ancient battlefield from uh, the the final battle which sort of vanquished Sauron at the end of the, the last Saturday. alliance yeah uh, it was the alliance. battle of Dagoland. Oh, good knowledge. Love it. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, and what, so this marshland, as they go through it, and there's this kind of area, it's very misty, and there's like candlelight and all the rest of it, and, and they can see these kind of dead figures underneath the water and Gollum says they're just ghosts but they don't seem to be just ghosts and it's all very kind of eerie and mysterious and spooky um so so that's what is there and Tolkien said in one of his letters that this basically was a sort of an inspiration whether he knew it at the time but this came from his inspiration of of war when he was at the Somme, which was a horrific battle, um, and he saw dead bodies lying in the mud and the, the the puddles and all the rest of it. So, how do you think 
both Tolkien and or what the differences are or similarities between how Tolkien and George R. R. Martin approach war? Hmm. You, you answer the question first. I have to think. Uh, well, about I'm, I'm, I, I'll give you. I'll give you my answer, and I'd love to yeah. hear your thoughts. And I know you're more of a Tolkien person than a George R. R. Martin person. Yeah. Uh, uh, so my take is that what is noticeable in uh, J.R.R. R. Tolkien's work is that although war happens lots, he doesn't describe it in detail. So you get that the classic example, I think, is like the 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 third Hobbit movie was like two three hours of battle which mm. if you read the hobbit was like five pages um and it's almost as if he didn't really need to describe all the details of war because he himself knew how terrible war was and the people that would be reading it at that time or who, who were around him in sort of post-war Britain and Europe and, 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 and wider also knew quite how horrible war was, so didn't need it described to them in detail. George R. R. Martin, I feel, almost wants to be showing people how horrible war is and what the impacts are. And, and this is, I mean, he's famously pacifist uh and it's almost as if he he's not personally experienced it but he wants to show people quite how horrible this is uh so um that's my kind of take on it i think they've got the same broad approach but the way they actually set it out is slightly different because they and their audiences have got slightly different uh, experiences that sort of uh, that they bring into reading the stories um but what would you what would you say was the influence on tolkien uh, it, of his experience of 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 being a soldier of actually seeing war and being in a war how would how would you say that affected what he wrote well, I think I, I, I would a bit disagree with you on, on the Tolkien thing, because um, if you read um, Unfinished Tales, if you read um, some of the books of the Lost Tales, um, especially The Fall of Gondolin, um, which is part of the Silmarillion, but it has its own book now. Um, I mean, he changed his mind a lot, but you have lots of battle scenes um, and he wrote battle scenes and he wrote because I, I often hear um, people complaining on there are no real battle tactics. He was a, he was a soldier. How are there no real battle tactics? And, you know, no, no like you said, no details and war, but that's in Lord of the Rings. That's not really true for the other books and for the first versions of the story he wrote there are a, there's a lot of battle tactics especially in the fall of gondolin so i can only recommend everybody to to read that book it's not an easy read because it's not like a normal novel or anything it's um what his son published from notes basically um so of the three books he published um Children of Hurin is the best book i would say and then baron and luthien and then fall of gondolin but um just to round it up, I agree in a, in a way, um, but um, in the old versions and the first versions, he talks a lot about war and tactics and battles and dragons flying in and destroying cities and everything. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, don't, I, 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 I think I wouldn't disagree with any of that. What I would say is that there's a difference between describing wars that happen and actually getting into the yeah, yeah. the sort of the mud and the dirt yeah, and all the rest I, yeah, of it and yeah. George R. R. Martin yeah. does that a lot uh yeah. we see people suffering in a way that with with J.R.R. Yeah. Tolkien we don't it's kind of as you say it's talking yeah. battle tactics it's quite high level uh we never actually sort of see all of the horrible stuff so yeah much. you don't uh, see people suffering and they they don't have exactly. bread and they they you know like because of the war all the supplies are gone and then people are starving in cities he doesn't talk about that that's 100 percent true yeah absolutely stephen stark hi welcome uh saying sorry i'm late uh here's my late fee with a super chat thank you there is no late fee you're very welcome at any time stephen um uh but thank you uh, so much um let's go to a uh, question um 
Uh, Stephen Stark, I just spotted in the chat, says Baelish, Peter Baelish, Littlefinger is Gollum. Uh, <laughs> uh, no. I, no, no, I see where you're coming from, uh, but um, perhaps not. And then Bernie L says Mira Reed is Legolas, fight me. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe, I mean... Yeah, have you got any thoughts on either of them? Oh, Mod Mary says Theon is Smeagol. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, have, have you any thoughts on any of these ones? Uh, uh, no, I think I read before um, Brienne and Erwin somewhere, which I completely agree, uh, you know. Yes. They, are, okay. they are in love with the wrong men. They are female warriors not accepted by society and so on and so on um so that one i agree but theon is gonna like well, <laughs> explain yourself what mary Reek please is Gollum, i think is the is the people are coming yeah. up with now uh theon is pippin i mean i get legolas is i i mean I, guys uh <laughs> Drogon is core. <laughs> so, Who's my, uh, and, and Disputed Lands, you're now trolling us with Hot Pie is Luthien. Um, so, <laughs> uh, my take, my overall take here is <laughs> thank you, Amanda. Though, uh, my overall take here is that, that George R. R. Martin has not recreated Lord of the Rings with with characters from there with different names. That's not how it's worked. What he has no. done is taken some inspiration for some characters yeah. uh, and and uh, transplanted that into his own world. I think that for me, we've already talked about the John and Frodo, the Sam and Sam thing, I think is the most obvious one there. Uh, I, I um, love the Brienne Eowyn one. That really works for me too. And I think at the end, this kind of Euron Saruman thing also works. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that they are the same character in any of these ways. It's just that the kind of the inspiration for them comes from uh, Lord of the Rings. So that is where I, have I think another one varies is um, is Warm Tongue. You know, like whispering. Oh, Varys is worm tongue. <laughs> oh, I mean, I get that of being like the person who's like standing whispering. behind the throne, whispering things yeah. into the ear. Perhaps, um, uh, perhaps in the kind of the the heiress, the second Mad King way, maybe that's where where we're at. Um, uh, I, I think that uh, Bernie L, who's Tom Bombadil, will get onto Tom Bombadil in a moment. Uh, Phil H saying Blood Raven is really all of the wizards in one. Uh, yeah, I, I think so. So he would certainly see that as the way. The the kind of we we did a panel. Um, uh, the, the 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 two of us um, um, uh, and uh, wonderful, excellent other uh, other person who I don't think is in the chats. Uh, Carol. But, Carol, yes, um, uh, but uh, I'm hoping to get on to have a future chat about Lord of the Rings. Um, but um, we were talking about the kind of the overarching approach between the two, and I think that the one thing that I would say for me, the big difference is that the, for Lord of the Rings, it's very much this is everything we see is tr presented as true and uh, we're given third person omniscient kind of like uh, in, in storytelling whereas in George R. R. Martin's world it's always first person and what we're yeah. shown is not necessarily true it's just one person's perspective on the truth and that for me is the biggest yeah. difference between the two mm -hmm. um Let's go to oh Maura Lee. Thank you so much for the super chat saying loving this live stream. Thank you to you both. You're very, you're very welcome. Um uh and a, a couple of questions about merch. Merch I will tell you about in about five or ten minutes' time. So just 
uh, hang on. People have been asking for mugs. Mugs are coming. I can promise you that. Um, let's go to um, another question. Um, I think we'll come on to what we might see in the Amazon show in sort of the second half of this. Um, Maura Lee uh, just did the super chat, did have a question. I think she sent it to you, actually, yeah. uh, Helen, about the similarities between the Iron Throne and the One Ring. Uh, so I mean, do you want to sort of like start on that one? What, did you think that there is a clear link there or is this just... Well, well you, talk about it. What do you think? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, obviously, not obviously, it um, corrupt both corrupt people, right? We saw it. Um, we saw the throne corrupted, um, literally everybody who sat on there, and the ring does it. But the ring belongs to Sauron, right? He's a part of Sauron. He put his evil spirit, energy, whatever in the ring. And the ring has kind of a will of its own because um, especially in The Hobbit, you see that the ring wants to get back to Sauron. This is why um, he was found by um, um, Bilbo. Um, he wanted to be found. And all these little things, you know, he has a will of its own, of his his own. Sorry, it's late. <laughs> um, and I think the throne is a very different concept. Um, I think the idea behind it is very similar, but the because everybody is saying, you know, like they wanted to destroy or melt the throne. Um, and they obviously want to melt the ring, but it's a complete different storyline. Why and how? And um, they, in the end, they wanted to destroy Sauron. And, and that was the purpose. And the ring just stood for that. Um, so, yes, similarities with the corruption and everything. But, um, yeah, no. I don't think it's it's the same yeah <laughs> yeah i mean i i think i agree with you on this one that the they are similar in terms of they are symbols of power yeah in that so the one ring was forged in order to give sauron power over the peoples of middle earth that was the whole cunning plan was that the the, the other rings were there uh, and then, you know, the elves, the dwarves would have them. Uh, eventually they got to the humans who became the ring wraiths. Uh, and then the one ring would control all of those other rings. And that was that was the idea. Uh, and so the one ring itself, whoever had it wanted power in some way. Uh, and then it corrupted them in some way. Even and Sam. Poor even Sam. <laughs> Sam is perfect. <laughs> don't don't diss Sam. Uh, <laughs> no. The, but um, the um, the Iron Throne represents that lust for power because the whole the, the the idea of the Game of Thrones is everybody seems to be focused in on getting the Iron Throne, and while they're focused in at kind of high level, whilst everyone is focused in on struggling to get the Iron Throne. Uh, they're ignoring the real threats that are actually out there from uh, dragons and white walkers and the rest of it. So the, 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 the one ring, the iron throne do rep both represent power and the fact that that corrupts people and actually changes who they are. Now you're right though, that there's a very clear difference in, in sort of like the, uh, what they are and what people are wanting to be doing with them and all the rest of it. So I think that there, there is a nod there, but I don't oh. think it's a very clear um, uh, sort of one thing to the other. Um, I, I did see just the last word on on the um, uh, is one character uh, in Lord of the Rings the same as the character in uh, Game of Thrones. A, a, a few people um, have been saying clearly Boromir is Ned Stark. <laughs> What? <laughs> I don't, don't know where that's come from. Um, anyway, uh, the voice. He posted. Of... Did, did did you see the the uh, tweet? Uh, I think he tweeted. Uh, Jean Bean tweeted out. Please stop killing me or something. You hold like a <laughs> like a hostage sign. Stop killing my characters or something. Um, uh, 
Uh, and uh, Gemma, Secret of the Citadel, hello, uh, as you've been uh, asking for me to say hello. Uh, <laughs> Voice of Reason, uh, thank you so much for the Super Chat, saying, what do we think about the differences in the ways that uh, Martin and Tolkien portray love and sex? We will actually get on to that. In fact, well, let's do that one now, because I had a question exactly this uh, from Jigs M, um, who was saying, George R. R. Martin has commented on the lack of sex and female characters in Lord of the Rings. Um, since the Amazon show is not directly based on Tolkien's work, I'll just say a word about that in just one second. Do you expect this to be different there and perhaps more similar to Game of Thrones? Now, uh, this uh, not being directly based on Tolkien's work is... So there's a rights issue that's going on here that is very detailed, and I won't go into the detail, and frankly, I don't know all of the detail because it's very complicated, but Amazon have not bought the rights to all of Tolkien's work. That's not what's gone on here. Yeah. They have bought the rights, which allows them to do stuff in the second age. Basically, it's like the appendices, the Silmarillion, things like that. Uh, and it's very clear that uh, Tolkien's estate... Uh, are very absolutely hot on what they are and are not allowed to do yeah. and they're not allowed to change anything in yeah. what Tolkien uh, produced. What Tom they... Shippey gave a good interview on that if people are interested. Um, he said what's possible and what's not possible. Yeah, exactly. He's a Tolkien scholar. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what uh, one of the things that he was pointing out was that, as I said right at the beginning of this live stream, if you've chosen to set it in the Second Age, which they seem to have done, uh, that gives you 3,441 years, which is a lot of time. And uh, Tolkien tells us stuff that happened in that time, but we don't have like year by year breakdowns or anything like even decade by decade breakdowns. We just have the highlights of when certain people became king or queen, what Sauron was up to at various times. But even then, Sauron kind of like disappears for a millennium here or there. It's just like, uh, we don't know what he was up to. Clearly lots of nefarious things because that's what Sauron does, but they could theoretically write stories about the what Sauron was doing in the first thousand years of the second age because we have no information on it. And as long as none of that story contradicts what Tolkien wrote then they could do that so that's where this kind of like it's not based on what Tolkien wrote is that it is going to be within the framework of what Tolkien wrote but there is not a, a detailed story like we have with Lord of the Rings that they're adapting this is set a, a series a, a story within the world that Tolkien created rather than an ad adaptation of a story. Yeah. Um, and and they, they are not allowed to go against characters because, I mean, maybe we're talking about that later. There are and there will be, I'm pretty sure, characters um, that were already alive in the Second Age. We know from, from the Lord of the Ring movies and books. And um, they're not allowed to go against their characters and arcs and stories and whatnot. So that has to be correct. Exactly. So the Tolkien estate will be on this. So I think that yeah. if there is, um, and they are renowned for their attention yeah. to detail. <laughs> so um, I think that uh, a lot of people have had reservations. Are they going to be true to what was there in the sort of the, the Tolkien's legendarium? I think the answer is they have to be. They yeah. absolutely have to be. And the fact that they've got people like Tom Shippey on board, he's not clearly, he's not yet completely there as uh, involved in the development, but they will run things past him. And this is a guy who spent literally decades as a professor of Tolkien and understanding yeah. the world. So, so they've got the right people there. Um, and uh, I think actually worries that it is not going to adhere to Tolkien's world. I think we can relax a little bit about that. But let's get on to this question. So uh, the, the George R. R. Martin has commented on the lack of uh, sort of uh, sex and female characters <laughs> in Lord of the Rings. Um, uh, we were joking beforehand, clearly in Lord of the Rings, no one ever has sex and that's just a fact. Um, and there are very few women uh, that's also a fact. Um, do you think that's going to be different in the show? 
Well, um, you know, I made this epic uh, chart for you uh, for one yes. of your streams, where and I thought, um, hmm, who could be uh, in uh, in the second age? Like, what what characters are there? And there's literally Galadriel, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, because we can't get Luthien, she's first age, um, and all the others, we know they, they were not born um, at that time. I mean, we will get women. And um, if um, we're shown Numenorians, I think we will get women because there were a few um, queens um, in Numenor um, and there are really cool storylines about them. Um, and, you know, like them getting um they had to get married against their will so somebody could rule and blah blah um so really interesting stuff um but yeah not really although they make up somebody like Eowyn being you know like a Numenorean Eowyn um but it really depends on on where they are but but for the elves there's no except Galadriel there's no really important women. Do you, do you know anyone like except her? Uh, not I mean, not Luthien, but elves it. per se. I mean, I think that what I would pick up on is what you were saying about the the Numenorians is that they um, they specifically got rid of male preference primogenitor, which is the you know the 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 man has to. Inherit, basically yeah. inherit, um, and so you actually, if you go through um, the 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 monarchs of Numenor, actually, and I can't remember the exact number, but there were three, four, five, maybe uh, queens, yeah, uh, who ruled it, um, as as well as all the kings. So I think that uh, if they want to, they can have. Uh, strong female lead characters in this, and I think that yeah. that's that's entirely possible. Um, so uh, I don't think that it's going to be quite as um, HBO ish, let's put it that way, uh, as mm -hmm. Game of Thrones. Uh, I don't think they're going to have uh, all the, the kind of the uh, sort of the violence and nudity and all the things that HBO does so wonderfully well. Um, uh, I think that it will be staying true to the ethos of what Tolkien put down on paper. Uh, but, 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 but listen, I mean, in the movies, did you miss that in the movies or do you, because I said before, I'm a big Star Wars fan, even in Star Wars, you know, love in Star Wars is, um, I love you, Han. I know <laughs> this is all you get. This is literally all you get. Right. So um, in Star Wars, in Lord of the Rings, I, I'm not missing that because there's so much other stuff. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't miss it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and I think that that's the uh, that's the point is that this is the 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 ethos of how um, J.R.R. Tolkien wrote it, and and people in the chat been pointing out that, that fundamentally he was writing stories for his children, and so yeah. no, we're not going to be getting. Um, uh, the kind of things that we saw in in Game of Thrones, um, uh, but I think we will see more female characters because he did include more female characters in the histories than he actually did in the Lord of the Rings um, and the Hobbit, of course, um, where you get like this uh, all male group traveling off to go and uh, um, uh, go to the Misty Mount uh, to uh, the Lonely Mountain. It's uh, we will get more female characters, I think, in this one. Uh, LMC, thank you so much for the uh, the super chat. Very generous, thank you. Saying it's been so long since I've been able to join live. Hello and thank you. You're very welcome. Um, but I did say, guys, I was going to roughly halfway through this stream. I would take a moment <laughs> to tell you about the mugs. So the time has come. Uh, people have been uh, asking for indie beat mugs for a while. Um, what I'm doing is that in a week's time. I will launch a sort of a store where if you want to get at the moment, it's 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 just in deep geek branded materials. I'm going to I've got quite big plans for this, for where we might go with this in the future. But uh, if you are wanting an in deep geek mug or T-shirt or anything like that, that is the way you need to be going. But uh, I am doing a special offer. Uh, now as we're launching this uh, for if anyone wants to become a patron of in deep geek. Um, and I'll talk about that in just one moment. Uh, at a ten dollar uh, a month level, uh, then you will get a free mug if you sign up. It 
this month because uh, I get a special offer on this one. And so if you want to get a free mug, uh, then if you just have, all you have to do is become a $10 patron of In Deep Geek. And if you are already a $10 patron of In Deep Geek, uh, there's a message waiting for you in Patreon. You can have one for free as well because, you know, I don't think it's fair for just the new people. You, if you've been supporting this channel for a long time, I really appreciate that, and I, I want to uh, give a little bit back. Uh, so uh, the um, patrons, for those who don't, uh, pay, or Patreon, for those who don't know, uh, is, is a way to support not just me but other content creators as well um, uh, through a sort of a, a monthly subscription or a, a, a patronage level, and at each different level, then you get different benefits as i say it's not just me lots of other uh, wonderful creators do this so please do go and check out their stuff as well uh, as far as i'm concerned um as i say at the ten dollar level now you will get a free mug when you're joining so please do go and check that out if you're watching live in the chat i suspect that one of my wonderful moderators will have put a link to um, of course chrissy already of course did. chrissy already has <laughs> Chris, Chris, chrissy is uh chrissy Moldstone's mod supreme uh is is well ahead of this game um and if you're watching later then do check out the description uh there will be a link down in the description to that as well uh the other things i wanted to say i'll give all those details again at the end of the stream uh but uh the other thing i wanted to say in terms of content that's coming up on this channel as i said Hobbit Day, Sunday, 22nd of September, I'll be launching my first Lord of the Rings video, which is explaining what happened in the Second Age and therefore what we might see on the uh, the TV show when it happens. Um, uh, but I've also got my normal uh, routine of Traveller's Guide coming out as well. And, um, uh, and do check that one out because uh, I, this one I've... Uh, uh, anyway watch it i think you'll like it um, oh my god okay best comment ever robert i'm sorry i'm just following the chat um i want an in deep uh geek robert funko <laughs> <laughs> i love that uh, bring it well, maybe, maybe one day be, at the moment <laughs> at the moment there's a limited range you can get you will be able to get mugs you will be able to get t-shirts hoodies I think maybe a mouse mat, uh, fun, Funko. <laughs> uh, gi give me time, guys. Give me time. Um, uh, but anyway, I've got good plans for that. Um, but at this point, what I normally do is I normally hand over to my uh, esteemed guest and say, so what have you got coming up on your channel? Um, now, Helen is and has been for about <laughs> the last year. I'm so going to say this as politely as I can because oh I, I, I like Helen a lot. Uh, <laughs> Uh, for about the last year, she's been promising to launch her channel with Lord of the Rings material, and it's always, as far as I can tell, about two or three weeks away from doing it. Um, uh, <laughs> can we expect any content on your channel anytime soon, Helen? Oh, well. As long as you people keep inviting me, why would I? No. The thing is, listen, um, there will be. I got a channel logo. Um, I, I got a lot of things going, but I'm a professionalist and professional. Prof I'm a professional. <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> clearly not. Um, and uh, I want everything to be perfect. And I still think I have got a bit of, oh, wait, my computer tells me it will shut down. Wait second um and um i want everything to be perfect and um I'll, I'll be moving soon and then i have way more time and then i promise um i get i get the content on because i mean you people can say clearly see i love to talk about lord of the rings and uh i can yeah i i will <laughs> <laughs> it's a short answer Plus, Robert literally asks me every week, so it will I, happen. I, I do, I do. <laughs> um, uh, pe people seem to be asking for in deep geek shampoo, um, <laughs> shot glass. Oh, shot I will glasses. be selling shot glasses. Well, because, I mean, guys, yeah. I will, I will investigate this. I, 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 you know me by now. As I say, I will, I will get to these things, but I'm, I'm not not as up to, up to speed with all of these things as i'd love to be this is why i still haven't got a professional backdrop behind me uh one day guys i promise you uh, indeed geek glasses well yeah maybe maybe one day um okay let's uh move on to um 
some things about what we might be able to expect from the show when it happens. Um, so uh, first of all, let's start talking about some of the characters. We sort of touched on this, so you were talking about this a moment ago. Um, um, Casey of House Lawbridge says, do you think that we will see any of the few characters that were alive during both the second and the third age? Um, uh, asking about Gandalf, Galadriel and Elrond. Do you think, uh, well, who do you think? You suggested Elrond, was it? Who, who else do you think we might see? Um, well, we don't know his twin brother, but I'm pretty sure if they start early, because what, what you said before, so we have 3,441 years, and we have um, 1,300 years be between the forging of the rings and um, the War of the Last Alliance, because I'm pretty sure you know we got so much information on the forging of the rings um so i think it will play well the thing is they um we will have i think five seasons were confirmed with apparently 20 episodes ish it, it it's not sure but five seasons so i mean you can you can start in the beginning with with the with the the, the creation of numenor and with el, el Ros twin brother um Elrond's twin brother, Elrond, sorry, it's really late, um, going to Numenor. And uh, so I think Elrond is a given. Um, and Rivendell and all that, because that existed. Um, Gandalf was unfortunately not in Middle-earth. He was, he existed, but he was in Valinor. He was not in Middle-earth. He came in the beginning of the Third Age to Middle-earth. So Gandalf, no. So And I don't think they're allowed to change the plot line. Mm. And... Um, then who else do we have? Obviously, Sauron, Galadriel, her husband, Celebrimbor. I mean, we haven't seen much of him, but he's really important, actually. Um, and obviously, the ring rates, they show up in the Second Age. Um, really cool. I think, I hope, because um, the... the um, um, sorry, the, the main ring raid, uh, he, he's like uh, the... Um, the Witch King. Witch King of Angmar, sorry. Yeah. Uh, the Witch King of Angmar, he's one of my favorite characters. So maybe we get a bit of backstory on him. Um, that would be time for that. And then um, who else is alive? I, I think, I mean, Thranduil, he could come back because he was alive then. Um, his his father died in, in the Battle um, of the Last Alliance. And then he took over. So Thranduil, possibility. Um, Glorfindel, who had actually the role of that was given to Arvin, you know, when, when they rescued Frodo in the in the water, in the river. Um, so he could come back and Legolas could possibly, we don't really know when he's born, do we? I think he could. I think he's third age. His, his dad will be around. We don't really know because I think he just says um, when they're in Fangon, he just says, um, I feel really young entering mm. this forest but i don't think we know but Thranduil definitely he he was alive so that's it we don't we don't all the all the humans they are not born then um that's it yeah exactly so so it's actually not many no i think that the key thing is sauron out of yeah. the characters he is the one who um, and I'll cover this in my video in a couple of days' time, uh, but the, the two key things happening in the Second Age are uh, the rise and fall of Numenor, this sort of great island nation, and Yay. what's Duma going Valeria, on. Valyria, just saying, parallel. <laughs> uh, absolutely, Green, and Al Atlantis and, and, and all the rest lost, of it. And, yeah, and the, the, the downfall was literally the same. The reasons were the same, because they were greedy, they wanted more... Yeah, yeah, and the the other thing is Sauron. This is all about again the rise and fall of Sauron. Is is ha what happens in the Second Age, and the two stories combine because Sauron goes over to Numenor as part of this, and and sort of allows himself to be, be taken prisoner, and then sort of rises up and uh, uh, sort of like. Uh, 
drips poison into their ears and and, yeah. and tells them that they can they can uh, do all sorts of things that really they shouldn't do um so uh, so the the two big stories are what happens with Numenor and what happens with Sauron and I think that uh, the best guess for where this is going to be set is in that kind of period with Numenor and Sauron. Yeah. Um, so uh, beyond, I mean, what you've said, I think that's entirely right. I think Elrond, Galadriel are the, the other two sort of goody characters who we probably will see somewhere uh, along the line. Um, I think Glorfindel was an interesting shout because he's very important in the books and the kind of the history um, uh, didn't show up on the in the films. There was I I saw a suggestion about uh, the blue wizards. For mm. those who don't know, so mm -hmm. the, the the wizards uh, we know about Gandalf and we know about Saruman. There's also Radagast who appears in the Hobbit movie, uh, mm. and uh, who I thought, incidentally, Sylvester McCoy, I thought was brilliant as as him. I thought it was excellent. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, there's also there were a couple of blue wizards who we don't mm. get huge amounts of information on, but may have turned up at the end of the Second Age. So there's a possibility of them as well. Um, but mostly this is going to be characters that we do not know uh, or haven't met uh, in sort of the, the Lord of the Rings or, or the Hobbit. So it's mostly going to be new characters. Yeah, and it makes it easier for them because I think, like, look at what happened with Star Wars when they recasted Han Solo, right? Um, there was so much backlash because obviously um, Alden Ehrenreich is not um, the real Han Solo. But, I mean, come on, people. And um, I think if you don't cast um, Galadriel um, with... Uh, um, Oh, what's her name? Um, and um, th there'll be lots of backlash. So I think that they only will use a few characters and then start completely anew. Yeah, I I agree. And I, I think the key one is uh, is Sauron. And actually, we had a super chat, a uh, voice of reason, thank you so much, saying, who would you cast to play Sauron in human form? So this is a this is a good question <laughs> because in in uh, the Lord of the Rings time, then he's this kind of sort of ethereal figure. We kind of let's see the eye of Sauron. Um, yeah. Back in the Second Age, he was able to sort of take on human form, and we had that. There's the sort of various words used to describe him as being sort of like beautiful and and uh, yeah. lovely and things like that. So he um, called himself Anatar, giver yeah. of gifts or something. Exactly. So what we've got, and he was in hiding for a long time, pretending yeah. not to be Sauron. It, it was a long time into the game before he actually sort of announced himself that, ah, here I am. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that who they cast to play Sauron, I think, is a fascinating question. Um, I mean, I, I it has to be somebody who is physically beautiful in some way and also has got a kind of a charisma to them i mean i see this as a kind of like a tom hiddleston thing myself that's that's where i would go with yeah. it, but it, it <laughs> <laughs> I mean, clearly uh and, and and any other thoughts i i think uh, someone posted cillian murphy i'm not sure oh, if i yeah. pronounce it i i can see that yeah. But he's short. I think he's short, right? I imagine because he he portrays himself as an elf or an um, um, a Valar, mm. and um, so he should be tall. So Cillian Murphy, no, uh, you need a you need a tall guy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a few other suggestions here. Jude Law, quite possibly. Rafe Fines, I think, again, is probably a little bit too old. Uh, Nathan Fillion. Uh, I mean, I love Nathan Fillion, but he's not really where I would go with this one. Uh, Killian Murphy, yes, I absolutely see. So I think that what we're looking for is 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 uh, an actor or, I mean, again, this is the kind of thing we, we had this with the prequel talk of Game of Thrones. Are, are we 100% sure that these characters uh, that, that this has to be a, a male character could this be a female character and it's entirely possible uh within this the the world that we know that sauron at that time could take on human form 
it's entirely possible that he could take on female form as well. So, yes, there's a possibility, I think, that we could see a female Sauron um, uh, because that's the kind of the guise that um, uh, he could take on. But um, what the, the other thing, and this kind of ties into the question we had earlier about the difference between the Iron Throne and the One Ring, is that you have to kind of view... Um, the the One Ring in kind of modern parlance is like a Horcrux from yeah. uh, Harry Potter, is that he poured his essence and soul into that ring. And that is why when it got cut off his finger um, at the end of the second age, but at, you know, in the kind of like the, the first scene they showed us in the films, uh, that's why his sort of bodily form sort of went away. Um, uh, he would not get that back until he got the ring back. So that was what was going on there. When uh, he was still sort of in possession of the ring, then he could take on uh, human form, as it were. Um, we did have another super chat from uh, Donald Peoples. Thank you so much. Saying, um, <laughs> for the future launch of Robert Funko with removable glasses. <laughs> Thank you. The Funko <laughs> Robert is... Um, <laughs> Uh, clearly Aww. a winner. Um, uh, Carl Karsnark saying Men of the West is a great Lord of the Rings channel here on uh, YouTube. Yeah, there's it there is. are a few yeah. of them out there. Uh, I name checked a couple last time. I think I said the Philosopher's Game. Were there any? I know uh, you. Who's you also were, a German? I love who's him. Who's also a German? <laughs> <laughs> um, are, are there any others that you would you would want to sort of draw people's attention to? Um, yes, and unfortunately, they have literally like 2,000 subscribers or something. Um, it's um, He's like um, a bit like uh, Tom Schiffi. He's a professor um, for the um, – it's a free university. He's an American guy, um, and it's a Mythgard um, University, Mythgard Institute. I can um, – Maybe after, not in this live chat, but I'll drop you the link. I don't have it here. They have a YouTube channel and you can listen to all the classes for free. Um, his name is Corey Olson. He wrote a few books and uh, stuff on on uh, on uh, Lord of the Rings and everything. And he's a really deep into the um, Lost Tales and um, all that and the Silmarillion. So there are so many cool classes. The videos are unfortunately like two hours long, but you learn <laughs> so much and they go really deep. And um, it's really interesting. And I can only, because they deserve so much more subs. It's um, very, he's very knowledgeable and very nice. And it's Mythgard Institute, Mythgard University. And uh, Corey Olsen is his name. We will find the link. Really, really cool. Absolutely very so. deep anal analyzing. And and uh, guys, you know my approach on this channel has always been uh, is that I'm not just trying to keep people to myself. If there are good channels out there, I'm going to try and direct people to go off and and, and get excellent content elsewhere. So um, uh, as I move more into Lord of the Rings content, then yes, I'm going to be getting more Lord of the Rings uh, uh, content providers. I hope onto these live streams as well. Um, I will for the foreseeable future it'll be mostly about game of thrones the song of ice and fire but i will start moving into doing lord of the rings ones uh, as well as a sort of we move closer towards the uh, the launch of the show Yay. which inc incidentally uh, for those who don't know the timelines are they have just announced officially that the the principal shooting will be happening in new zealand which i think is probably good news because we yeah that for, for most of us then that is what middle earth looks like um uh, and uh, they i imagine that this will shortly be followed by a number of different sort of casting announcements we've had one official one so far uh, and i've forgotten her name but she was uh, really good in picnic at hanging rock if you've seen that yeah um uh, and uh, so i think we'll see a few more casting announcements coming up they have to uh, legally have started shooting this year because that was the deal they came up with that two they had to, yeah. within the two years of signing the first deal they had to have uh, started shooting. So uh, I imagine they'll probably sort of tweak that around and just sort of do like uh, background shots and things like that until they've got the whole lot in place. But 
once they start shooting, that's the point at which we can start the clock ticking on when can we start expecting the uh, the show to appear. Certainly not for another year after that, probably a little bit longer. So that's the kind of the time scale we're looking at. I, I'm thinking then that we're looking at probably 2021. Uh, for it so uh, we're probably yeah. still at least 18 months away but uh, that's the, roughly the time scale yeah if if they have 20 episodes um they they need at least set well if they have a few locations they need seven months for shooting and then pre-production wrapping up everything they need one and a half yeah yeah Exactly. And it will it will take a while to so say that this was the room. It might have been Tom Shippy again who's saying it was going to be 20 episodes. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. He that's a lot. It is a lot. I wouldn't place too much yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, weight on on yeah. uh, that. Tom Shippy is an absolute expert on Tolkien. He has not been hugely involved in the development of the show yeah. yet. So uh, I, I would wait to hear what the uh, the showrunners say about that. Um, but talking about uh, characters who were around at the time, um, one of my favourite characters from the book uh, didn't, tragically, didn't make it. The film. <laughs> uh, Tom Bombadil. Um, oh Bonds wants to know whether the Lord of the Rings show will include Tom Bombadil. Would love to see some backstory on him. Uh, first of all, I'll get your take on Tom Bombadil. Were you disappointed he wasn't in the films? Uh, and do you think there's a chance we might see him? I, I wasn't disappointed that he was not because it would. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, what first question to you, who's Tom Bombadil for you? I mean, there's no correct answer because we don't know. Um, maybe Tolkien even doesn't know because he literally changed his mind a hundred times. See, um, ask ask his son and all the notes he found. Um, they're literally three versions of Galadriel. Um, and um, yeah, so who's Tom Bombadil? What do you think? Well, Tom Bombadil... Uh is the spirit of middle earth he is the spirit of the land um mm. that's that's where i am at um and i wish i could quote exactly where i got it from one of the times tolkien was talking about this this is where he came from um and goldbury um uh his wife is uh, the spirit of the changing of the seasons so th so that is that is the sort of the uh, the description of them that Tolkien came out with that I think works best with what we see in The Lord of the Rings. Um, but for those who only saw the films and haven't read the books, he kind of appears relatively early on, just as the uh, the hobbits are escaping from the Shire, um, uh, but before they sort of meet up with uh, Aragorn and all the rest of it. And uh, Tom Bombadil is this... Uh, a ridiculous character, and I say that in the best possible way. Um, uh, he seems entirely unaffected by any of the things around him. He yeah. takes the ring, uh, he like does little magic tricks with it, he puts it on, he doesn't go invisible like everyone else, it doesn't seem to affect him at all. Um, he does these ridiculous rhymes um, uh, and just seems <laughs> to enjoy life. Um, and then and the Hobbit... good friends with Farmer Maggot, my Absolutely. personal hero, the, the <laughs> real hero of this story. Farmer <laughs> Maggot, shout out to you. <laughs> uh, so he is he is this character, and he's never really explained. Um, and then sort of Gandalf kind of like mutters to himself about how he's always been there and all the rest of it. Um, uh, so it's uh, he is quite an enigmatic figure i entirely understand why he wasn't in on the sh uh, in yeah. the films yeah. um even though i missed him uh because i don't see how on earth you could put him in there without it being like what what was that about <laughs> um exactly so my in terms of whether he will be on the show i think my answer is he was there uh, I don't think there's any doubt about that. He seems to have pretty much always existed and was going to pretty much always exist. Um, so he was around. 
Um, but he probably was just based where he was based, um, and he wasn't there involving himself with high politics with Numenor and all the rest of it, because actually he is the spirit of the land, and actually what he cares about are the trees and the plants and the, the ecosystems and all of these kinds of things. So I don't think we will see him, um, uh, but he will he will be there at that period in time. Does that chime yeah. with where you're at? Yep, his spirit. Where when I when I first read um The Lord of the Rings, I thought he is talking. Um yeah, I don't I don't know why. I, I thought he put himself in, in the story and um I don't I don't know why I have this idea, but I read other people's had the same idea. And um, but I'm, I don't think that anymore. But it, it's interesting. Or some people are saying he's he's a Vala because um, yeah, same like you said. But the Vala, you know, like the the gods. Um, practically, we don't know that much about them um, in Lord of the Rings. But in the Silmarillion, you learn um, how they how Iluvatar, the god, created the earth, and then the Vala, the spirits came, blah blah, and um, people were thinking he's a Valar because the Valar, like the Roman gods, they stand for the seasons, they stand for earth, moon, the seasons. And um, yeah, people said he, he he's one of them. I don't think so. I think it, it, it's similar to what, what you said. He's the personification of, of Middle Earth. Yeah, exactly. And and this is why when they were discussing one of the options when they're discussing what to do with the ring was, well, why don't we give it to Tom Bombadil if he's just like if it doesn't affect him? And he'd lose uh, it. <laughs> exactly. And this is this is what this is basically. I think it was Gandalf who said, you know, Gandalf what? said it. Yeah. Yeah. He, he would, it, it would just be so insignificant to him that he would lose it yeah. and then somebody else would find it and they would have the problem again. Yeah. So. It's like um, he is a character that is over and above everything and also underneath everything. It is, he's not going to be involved in it. He, he, he seems to quite enjoy spending time with the Hobbits but, and happily saved them and all the rest of it, but it, didn't, it wasn't really affecting him. It, he didn't do it because he thought they were on some great mission and they had to save the world. He just yeah. did it because he enjoyed it, and that yeah. was what, what, where he was coming from. Yeah. Um, and so in, in answer to the second bit, Bonds, when you're saying we'd love to see some backstory, I don't think Tom Bombadil has a backstory. I think he always was as he was. Yeah. And that is the that is the point of him, is that he as the spirit of, of the the land or the world, I think he just was like that. And so he just sort of came into being as he was and he would carry on being as he was until he ceased being. Um, Anna Peabody, thank you so much uh, for the super chat. I didn't see a question attached to that, or was there one just under it? Hang on, let's just have a quick check. Oh, yeah, so there was a question here saying, do you think they will bring in elements from Game of Thrones seasons one to six to Lord of the Rings, such as more character development, grittiness of war, multiple plot lines pulling together? Um, yeah, <clears> I think, <throat> well, I think that they will certainly have learned the lessons from Lord of the Rings. Uh, from uh, Game of Thrones uh, and how that works and when uh, it's moving too far from the books makes it not work. Um, <laughs> so uh, I think that's definitely what's going to happen. In terms of character development, I think they're definitely going to be trying to focus in on that. The grittiness of war, I think, is the interesting one because what we were talking about earlier was this idea that... Um, uh, Tolkien in his writing doesn't focus on the grittiness of war. He he just takes it as a as an assumption that everybody understands that war is horrible. Um, so uh, I think that that's where they're at. I if I were them, I would be trying to capture the feel of the the, the Lord of the Rings movies and going with that. Yeah. Um, which has to have a, a strong central plot, but lots of characters and then things going on around the outside. And yes, that means multiple plot lines, um, uh, but I think that it has to be quite clear and focused um, rather than uh, Game of Thrones or certainly A Song of Ice and Fire gets very, and I mean this in the best possible way, very muddled with the amount of different plot lines going on and you have to really focus in on what's, what's happening. I think they will keep it 
quite clear. But did, did you have sorry, did you, Helen? Did you have any thoughts on that one? Yeah, no, no, same. And and the thing is, you know, the the question of the time because we said it's literally over three thousand years. And um, I mean, Game of Thrones, how many years is that? Like four years, five years, maybe that the whole Game of Thrones series. Is it yeah. like five years from from? It's season rough, one roughly to... roughly a, a, a season per year, roughly. Yeah. Oh, okay, then let it be eight uh, years. But alone, the the War of the Last Alliance is twenty one years, um, and then like a thousand years before uh, the downfall of Numenor. So it's it's you know how do they how do they close these gaps? Is it per season, a thousand years per season, or it, it's really hard because you need characters. I mean, you have main characters like the elves who who are still alive, who could still be alive during a time span of three thousand years. But you need, you know, you need, if you talk about character development, maybe that's why they have 20 episodes. If you talk about character development, um, you, you, you want to see the character you, you fell for in season one. You want to see him in season five, right? And not lose him. So it's it's hard. Mm. It is. I mean, I think the, the, the one kind of like mitigating factor is that the, Many of the characters, although this covered many years of time, they did live for longer. So the elves, obviously, yeah, did. the Numenorians, yeah, and the Numenorians uh, uh, lived for uh, roughly three times a normal human lifespan. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and so you get a character like Aragorn, who's like many generations down, he still lives a very long life. Yeah. Um, so um, you get uh, characters who do that. So they've sort of got a a way out of this but the fact is that some of these things they may well have wanted to tell the story of the forging of the rings and all the rest of it but if you look at the timings there actually that takes a hundred years or more for all of those rings to be forged so it's not just an easy story that they can just sort of tell in a few episodes they would have to have huge time jumps so um yeah. it's quite a challenge that they've set themselves yeah um but yeah well, I, I I wish them all all the best of luck, and I'm still feeling confident. Uh, yes, but same. it's it's um uh, it's going to be quite hard for them to sort of choose where they do their story. Yeah. Um, guys, we've got about ten more minutes to go. Um, I've got a couple more questions from uh, my patrons to do, and we will pick up on as many questions. Now is the time. If you want to drop anything into uh, the chat, now is the time to do it. Um, can let's I, talk. Can I, oh, go. Can, can I go with one of the because I saw that a few times in the chat, like Mal Bashir. Sorry if I um if I butcher, butcher your name. I uh, talking was not forward thinking enough. Um, nearly all his characters are happy, happy, shiny. Um, I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I can only quote, like I said, when people ask me who's your favorite character or what's your favorite storyline, it's um, the, the Turin Turambar story. And I love that character. And yes, obviously, there are characters who, especially the elves, um, who, who don't have like a redemption, but they're evil elves as well. Um, but, but that's the nature of the elves. And um, you, you have characters that have an arc, that are evil, that have a redemption arc, et cetera, um, that have options and they fail and they try again. And, and there are lots of these characters. So I disagree. Uh, yeah, so I think, um, well, I sort of agree and sort of disagree. So uh, Gerard Tolkien had a very clear sense of good and evil. True. Um, in in a way he that George R. R. Martin, he, he was, he was a Catholic and he was very clear on what he thought was good and what he thought was evil. Uh, and George R. R. Martin has got a very clear sense of uh, moral grayness, yeah. which doesn't mean that he doesn't have really good characters, sort of, uh, you, you think of people like Brienne or Davos or Sam who are clearly good people. Yeah. Uh, and you have characters who are clearly bad people. You're, you're Ramses and your Joffreys of this world um so he does have that but he has a lot more shades in between whereas J.R. Tolkien um it's not that he has like just two camps you do have characters who have very complicated kind of like uh and I, th I think redemption arc is t is is 
too simplistic, but if you take the whole Gollum Schmigol thing, that's yeah. a clear arc yeah. and a complicated uh, relationship that a character has with himself. Um, and even you see someone like Frodo, who, Frodo who, yeah. who goes on a huge journey from uh, from when he started to where he ends up. So uh, I, I think it's simplistic to say that characters do not go on character arcs, uh, but I think it's very clear that Tolkien had a stronger idea of uh, we are fighting the good fight in order to defeat the evil. So that is where I think we're at. Can we talk quickly about Numenor? Um, yes. John St. Baptiste saying, uh, glad you've gotten to Tolkien. Uh, being that the new show is set in the Second Age, how much of Numenor do you think we will see? Um, uh, and saying, you know, I have a good feeling about this team that they put together, which I, I agree the team seems to be good. Um, uh, but what, what about Numenor? Do, do you think we're going to be mostly based on Numenor? Or how, mu how much of it is, is going to be there, do you think? Yeah, I think so, because, I mean, it literally drowned at the end of the Third Age and it it um, it was built um, and, and the Numenorians, the, the Edain, went there at the beginning, at literally day one. Um, so I think so. And I think we want, be, because we can't just see elves who are in Middle Earth. Um, so we need to see um, humans. And um, the, the most important, and the humans who who did the most, and who then went to Middle Earth and had they they um, built cities and they built ports and everything, and they came to Middle Earth. So I think we'll definitely see see a lot of Numenor. Yeah, I would ag I would agree with this. I think that the clear front runner for where this is going to be set is Numenor which is this uh this kingdom which rises and falls very dramatically and this is yeah. uh it it was um uh, the sort of the shining light of uh, uh humans as it were they I mean they came from sort of like the elves and humans but this is what this is the kind of the shining light and there is a lot of good stories going on there so i think we're largely going to be based yeah. there and and corruption and all those good things happen there. All so all the good um, things like corruption, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, but these make an interesting story. They do. Right? They they um, do absolutely do. And I think that this is what, so. And Sauron being there, it's being the kind of the yeah. leader of how to. Uh, he didn't start it. The kind of the fall that was already on underway, but yeah. it was him who brought it about. Uh, Lindsay Werner connected to this is saying how much of the first age will they include in the backstory? Uh, Erendil for Elrond and Elros backstory about the loss of Be uh, Beleriand. Uh, will they show Valinor? I think uh, mm -hmm. that there is a rights issue. I mentioned this earlier. I think that there's a rights issue in as much as they can't do things from the third age, they also can't do things from the first age. Uh, so I think that this is why they're sticking in there. That doesn't mean that they won't mention them. They may even do some kind of like flashback or something like that, but that's not where the story is going to be. So um, uh, we we may well see people talking about it, but I yeah. don't or think songs. That, like, or songs. Or songs. Or songs. Like, like, like Aragon, you know, we learn from Aragon about the Baron and Luthien story because he sang about it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I think that we're not going to see much of the first age. Um, we will hear about it. And obviously, uh, what happened at the end of the first age, in particular, at the end, impacts on what happens in the second age. So, you know, high level, we get uh, Morgoth, who was the first big baddie, the kind of the Satan vigor. Um, Red character ever. He, he basically gets sort of thrown down and banished. Sauron had been his lieutenant, and so he is actually there trying to work his way back up again. And that's this is the story of the Second Age. Numenor didn't always exist; it was brought up as a gift for the people who'd been fighting alongside the elves against Morgoth. So that was an end of the First Age, beginning of the Second Age thing that was going on there. So everything that happens in the Second Age is going to be. Uh, in the shadow of what happened in the first age, but I don't think they're actually going to be showing it. Sadly. Uh, sad, <laughs> sadly, I agree. 
Um, okay, let's. Um, I, I said we're going to finish at about this time. I've got one more question from a patron to go. Uh, but is there anything else you want to pick up on, um, Helen, either from the chat or just sort of something else you've been burning to say? <laughs> no, I'm fine. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, in that case, uh, we've got uh, Peg Leg Pete, who we can always rely on to come up with a fun question. Um, orcs versus the Night King and Undead battle. Who will win? Sorry, who, who against? Sorry, I was Orcs. Reading. Orcs? Versus yeah. the Night King and the Undead. Who's going to win? I think there's an easy answer to this one. Just the Orcs on, on Just our own. Orcs. No, it, yeah. Okay, all of Martin's characters will win. I th I think so. I think that I I have to agree because yeah. if they die, I, the, the, but the they Night need the King, witch. But witch king, night king is, could be interesting. Yeah. Witch king versus the night king would be a lot closer battle. It has to be said. Um, if it's just the orcs, then no, sorry, they're going down. Yeah. No. Um, yeah. uh, okay, uh, so uh, guys, I think we're going to wrap this up around there. Um, I will do my plug again for mugs in just one moment. But Helen, do you mm -hmm. want to let people know where they can find you on the internet? It's dark and full of terrors. Don't find me. No, um, <laughs> I <laughs> I uh, recently got back into Twitter. So I'm on Twitter but, uh, as the Clueless Fangirl and on Instagram as the Clueless Fangirl. And as promised, um, there is a YouTube channel and somebody said in there, what, she has a YouTube channel, there's no content. Yes, you're right. Um, yeah, that's it. Always the Clueless Fangirl. Right. Excellent. And if people want to, they can go to your YouTube channel and subscribe, waiting for your content, which will arrive very soon. Ish. Very <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, guys, uh, Helen is fantastic, has uh, great knowledge about Lord of the Rings, as, as, as you've seen today, and so I'll definitely be having her on uh, more as we get more into Lord of the Rings and J.R.R. Tolkien stuff going forward. Um, just to remind you, if you are interested in getting uh, an In Deep Geek mug, um, then uh, Helen, I'm going to make you disappear for a moment. You'll be back in a sec. Um, uh, that if you're interested in uh, an In Deep Geek mug, then do check out. There's going to be a link down in the description to my Patreon page. If you join up as a $10 patron as an as a welcome gift, uh, if you do that in the next couple of weeks, then you will get an Indie Geek mug. Um, launching next week will be the, uh, the store when you can get more than just mugs t-shirts mouse mats stuff like that um uh but uh, yeah please do go and check out uh, my patreon page if you're all at all interested in that patrons as i say ev every week i cannot do what i do without your support so thank you so much uh for all that you do uh there will be a link appearing here ish uh after the end of the live stream uh, which will be a link to my patreon page uh, and there'll be a link appearing here ish uh, to other live streams I've been done with other creators. Uh, but guys, thank you so much. I've really, uh, really enjoyed this chat. Uh, it's fantastic getting into the Lord of the Rings. Thank you, Helen. Thank you uh, to the chat. Uh, thank you for all the, the super chats as well. Take care, guys, and I will see you again next week. Bye. <laughs>